Welcome to an hour of HealthMade Radio. HealthMade is a community for natural health seekers who educate people about common health conditions and share extensive research on the most effective natural health treatments and promote legislation that protects our health freedoms. Our core concept belief is in the innate intelligence and healing power of the body, and if properly supported spiritually, emotionally, and nutritionally, it can find its way back to health. HealthMade Radio will bring information from integrative health experts throughout the world. Health is what you make it. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld, and I will be your host. Today's guest is Professor Ted McAllister. Professor Ted McAllister is a graduate of Oklahoma Christian College. He earned his master's degree from Claremont Graduate School before completing his doctoral degree in American Intellectual and Culture History at Vanderbilt University. A recipient of Woodrow Wilson Foundation's Charlotte W. Newcomb Doctoral Dissertation Fellowship, he also received the Leland Sage Fellowship as well as several additional grants, including one from Earhart Foundation. The author of a volume entitled Revolt Against Modern, uh, Modernity, <laughs> Modernity uh, Leo Strauss, Eric uh, Vogelin, and the Search for a Post-Liberal Order, he has completed a new textbook on American history entitled The Promise of Freedom, A History of the United States. McAllister has lectured frequently on the nature and future of American conservatism, including recent presentations at Oxford University and at Universität Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany. In addition to his research into con- conservative philosophy, he is currently working on a history of the baby boomer generation. McAllister serves as one of the editors of Roman and Littlefield's book series, American Intellectual Culture, which is designed to produce books that examine the intersection of culture and politics in American history. At Pepperdine, he teaches the core class entitled Ethical Dimension of Public Policy, great books and great ideas, as well as a variety of elective courses that focuses on putting policy debates in larger historical and philosophical, uh, philosophical context, including such classes as comparative freedom, public policy in modern America, and American democratic culture. Uh, Professor McAllister, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show uh, today. I'm, I'm really excited about what we're going to chat about today. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be with you today. I'm, I'm excited about it. So I'm just, just to kind of create a, a, a preface, I, I know where I found out about your, your work was uh, in a, uh, one of the publications at uh, Pepperdine University. And I, I guess not the Pepperdine University in itself officially creates, but it, it's, it's one of the ones that circulated through Pepperdine University. And mm-hmm. uh, there you, you you, you kind of try to create then these this open dialogue and good faith discussions in regard to very difficult subjects and and I wanted to see kind of how how do you feel that is received to be able to do that I mean what what is the kind of academic uh, environment to be able to do that do you, do you feel that's easy or is there a lot of pushback well, I, you have to answer that question relative to where you are. Uh, I, 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 let me add a little bit to the, the context to this because it matters, I think. Uh, I, I wrote that essay in uh, November in, during, a, during a very controversial time at Pepperdine uh, regarding the 1619 Project and the kinds of um, uh, uh, vituperative attacks against my dean and about the School of Public Policy, which is the school I'm at at, at Pepperdine. And um, this one, uh, this uh, essay was not, uh, was not allowed into the, uh, the student newspaper, The Graphic, uh, at the time. Uh, so it circulated among people sort of by email. Um, and so it, the decision was made um, when this new uh, this new outfit, the Pepperdine Beacon, started as an alternative newspaper uh, that uh, they would publish this uh, in the summer uh, to, uh, to, with a little bit of background in terms of its, uh, of, of, of its origins. But you're quite right that my goal uh, uh, for this essay was to try to give as coherent a voice to something that, I, that has been very incoherent 
Uh, that is to say, the arguments by those who are advocates for critical race theory, um, which are often contradictory and, uh, and rarely, in the case of the controversy here at Pepperdine, rarely rational. And so my goal was to give, before I, rather than creating a straw man, can I actually give a kind of brief but coherent defense or articulation of that point of view before I, I suggest that there's an alternative that, we, that, I'm, that I call the Christian liberal arts alternative, and then to conclude with uh, a claim that, these, uh, that you could choose one or the other, but you can't have them both in the long run, that they are incompatible because they have incompatible visions about the person, the human, uh, and about the kind of uh, society that they want to contribute to. Yeah, because one, one of the things is that when you look at the critical race theory, uh, I mean, it, it will, to, to me, it almost looks like if you are then creating anti-racism, you, know, you, you are then creating this division, you're in essence then creating racism, because I, mm-hmm. I want to be, behave as a, as a normal, loving individual to my fellow being, no matter what color, no matter what background, no matter what disabilities or uh, sex or I mean gender or, or anything I just want to be able to be function as a normal individual and love them as they are and just look upon them as a true individual without having to kind of look through the filter where they're this color so now I have to bathe in this way they're that color and I have to bathe in that way I mean it's, it's it, uh, what, what are your thoughts about that I mean to me that is what is being created by this type of theory yeah, I think it's important to, to remember that critical race theory is now being um, – something that, that almost no one heard about five years ago is now being deployed er- everywhere from boardrooms uh, to, uh, to kindergarten. And, um, and so there's this so – people are, are confronting something that they didn't know about a few years ago, and, and as – people confront it, um, as they confront it, particularly in schools where their children are being taught, um, there is no escape the, the, the escaping the common sense uh, understanding that this is, this is essentially a species of racism. Uh, they, the, the anti-racists, um, as they call themselves, are requiring us to think in terms of race, but they're not just requiring us to think in terms of race. They're requiring us to think in terms of, of race tied to oppression, tied to not only historical oppression, which is, which is one thing you could talk about, uh, I suppose, uh, but, they're, but, but about a system of oppression that they recognize that most of us are blind to, they claim, that requires you as you, come, as you confront it to recognize where you fit as in this racial hierarchy. Are you an oppressor or are you oppressed? And it doesn't give you an opt out uh, of that. You are either uh, uh, have white privilege, be, uh, that, that the whiteness of our society has given you privilege whether you ask for it or not. And therefore you either think in terms of racial categories or you're a racist because our system is racist and if you don't recognize that, then you are perpetuating it. As a result, the, the, the very idea of critical race theory, particularly its anti-racist uh, dogma at the core of it, is, uh, requires you to be a racist. Uh, and, and, and here we get to, I think, a, a crucial distinction or a crucial element here, that our normal everyday use of words is, all, is by all of the left is overturned. They will always use the, so that so they want to they, they want to, this racist system in order to correct uh, the past. But they they call it anti-racist, uh, and and so this double speak that emerges not just on race but on everything is crucial to their search for power, uh, and it makes it almost impossible to have a conversation uh, across this divide. Because once you challenge that assumption, you are simply displaying from their point of view your racist ideas or your racist sentiment, and they refuse to recognize the logic of their own argument. 
So in, in, in essence, the only way is to uh, force somebody that are the, the oppressor, uh, they have to, in essence, just be, be silent and be guilty because they are the oppressor. Yes, they they have to begin with recognizing that to speak on this subject is is to exercise power because remember the entire system is based upon a claim of knowledge to seeing how power is deployed in our society. And because they see it de de uh, deployed uh, in these racial ways, it means that anyone with power who tries to defend uh, an idea as, as opposed to simply listen to those who are are uh, on the other side of the power equation uh, is unacceptable. Um, so they give you a list of things you cannot say. You cannot say that I don't that that I that I I seek neutrality or I seek to be colorblind or any number of things are 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 perpetuating the system. So they made it so that any of the old sort of civil rights goals that we might have thought of in the 50s, 60s, and 70s as sort of the ideas and ideals for civil rights, they've turned those into, uh, into proof that you are, uh, uh, that you are not uh, sufficiently an anti-racist. And, and therefore, they, they, you are not allowed to speak. You simply have to own your, your, um, your privilege and do what you can not to exercise your privilege. For instance, in, in Dallas, Fort Worth, the Black Lives Matter movement is circulating a petition that where people will sign a pledge that they, uh, who are white and wealthy, that they will not send their children to any of the top 50 universities and they're going to, they claim they're going to publish those who refuse to sign it. So, they, you know, the, so they're, they're saying that you, as privileged, must give up that privilege by not sending your children to these kinds of schools that they identify as the schools of privilege. That's how it works. So how, how do you feel if, if we kind of, you're, you're talking about the, the movement of, of the 50s, 60s, and you know, even 70s, uh, how do you feel someone like Martin Luther King you know, Jr. looking at what, what is going on now? I mean, how, how do you feel his response would be? Well, I, yeah, I think that, that not only King, but those who survived him and who lived well into uh, our time uh, have, um, insofar as they remain faithful to those original mission, uh, uh, mission of the Civil Rights Movement, are, I think, uh, uh, appalled. Um, I would go even further. If you look at uh, if you look at the other side of the equation of the '60s, if you look at Malcolm X and the Black Power movement, that's not the same thing as the Black Lives movement today. There are some similarities, but there's a lot of difference. The focus upon Malcolm X, uh, which who recognizes a kind of racist society, just as the Black Lives Matter uh, do, they took the tack that they have to self empower. That they have to uh, learn uh, to to take care of themselves, and so even there, even on the radical side of the of the '60s civil rights movement, you do not have, uh, as you do today, a, a, an ideology that that they're seeking to impose upon every institution of our society. That is a racist ideology that says you are defined by your race and therefore you must behave appropriate to whether you have privilege or you are a victim. And so there's, I don't see any way of squaring uh, certain, uh, either side of that, of that civil rights movement in the 60s, but certainly not uh, the liberal Martin Luther King agenda. Uh, every basic principle of that agenda is betrayed, is undermined by, uh, by critical race theory. Yeah, I, I agree. I'll, I'm going to take a quick break. You're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm here with Professor Ted McAllister, and we are discussing uh, an extremely complex uh, discussion, uh, the critical race theory. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Professor Ted McAllister. Uh, Professor McAllister, so we're, we're talking about kind of how the the view of you know, the uh, you know the, the the black I mean the uh, the revolution I would say you know, where 
you had Martin Luther King Jr., you had uh, Malcolm X and then the predecessors and, and how what, what they were striving for. I mean, they were striving for uh, pretty much that we all could be together as, as one race. I mean, that we were humanity and we were all under one God and we were all should be loved the same and treated the same. But here now we are, are shifting that away so that you know, me as, you know, for my children, I'm supposed to then tell them that they are not uh, loved. I mean, they, they are loved, but they are supposed to not to be as grand and as uh, ex- become the individual that they truly want to be. You know, they are supposed to kind of uh, hunker down and, and, and be apologetic and feel guilty and feel sorry for something that they never did. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Well, not only are they having to uh, to essentially accept the the historical guilt uh, that uh, that comes to them from presumably from forefathers, uh, but they have to behave differently. It's not just their attitude. You, you've got you got to recognize it's got there that both of these elements are at play, and they're both damaging. On the one hand, the, what you're pointing to that you have to uh, tell people to internalize a guilt, a, a kind of guilt that they cannot get rid of, that they have to carry with them the rest of their lives. And they have to not only carry this guilt for something they did not do, uh, but they have to then see all of the, any uh, act of injustice or, or, or acts that appear to be unjust particularly if they're racially motivated uh, kinds of injustice, they have to then see themselves as implicated in this failure. That then requires of them uh, to, to make choices about uh, the right kinds of choices about how to live, because the goal here, as, as almost every one of the major theorists of critical race theory has acknowledged, uh, where does this end? Where do you want it to end? And and they almost always give the same answer. It is equity. And equity, of course, is not equality. It, it isn't equality before the law. It's not, uh, it's not equality of rights. It's not equality of dignity. It is where there are no differentials in groups of people in terms of outcomes. And so absent, so the only way that happens in, requires that uh, those people who, ha, who are being who have been more successful become less successful, uh, it, it and uh, and take on the blame for any injustices in the society uh, that our society have has. So it's, it's almost like you know you have a, a, a class of students and they are all only allowed to get a C. I mean, that, that's what it sounds to me like. I mean, well, that's equity, yeah, that would, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it, you, it, if you want to push their argument and, uh, to where it leads, it will lead to those kind of dystopic claims that, that say uh, everyone must have the same kind of outcome. Well, we, we're, we're getting there in classes in various schools. You can read – if you go online and, and do a Google search, you can read news stories – that show how schools are attempting, and not, of course, just schools, but other institutions, are, are trying to um, adjust what they're doing in such a way as to produce greater uh, equity of outcome. So, for instance, the, uh, the University of California school system is now getting rid of, of um, SAT scores because it turns out that SAT scores are making it harder uh, to to uh, get the kind of uh, equity of of in, uh, and inclusion uh, of the categories they want in the percentages they want, according to their uh, ideal about what is just, and so um, the, the pathologies that follow from this, and we've seen many examples. You can look at uh, some work by Glenn Lowry and others who followed out the the kind of economic impact of this. Whenever you uh, decide to get rid of the measures for entrance into a, into a university that, that are the best at predicting success, 
and, and because because it artificial because it favors certain kinds of races uh, statistically. When you get rid of that, then you almost guarantee the failure of those people who uh, who are not uh, who don't reach those thresholds because it turns out that SAT scores are for better or for worse very good predictors of success in in uh, in college. Uh, and so as a result, those people who are admitted who wouldn't have been admitted otherwise uh, begin to fail in higher percentages. And as they fail, they, they see the reason must be because of, a, of an unjust system that is, that is uh, racially uh, prejudiced against them. And as a result, they'll demand more changes. And you have this process by which the, the, the real problems are never solved. In fact, you have new problems that are created with every attempt to resolve the last problem. And so let's say then uh, we take the next step that they get what they want in the university. We're then bringing down the quality of the education because that, that would be the next step, correct? We would, we would need to bring down the quality to uh, make it so that these individuals would not fail and they would feel successful, correct? That's right. That's right. Feel is the operative word, right? Because yeah. because remember that 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 this is all premised upon upon assumptions about um, about everything from language uh, to, uh, to 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 the system that 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 we live in that that presents white faces as better than black faces on advertising. All of that is the background to this, and so. This, the assumption is that this creates a kind of inferiority uh, complex, and uh, as and the only way of, of remedying that is to is to focus upon affirming them, and 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 so the, I'll go back to the 1619 project here. The complaint about uh, about the School of Public Policy saying that we that we will resist the 1619 project on the grounds that it's it, it rejects uh, real history. The response to that was that you are abusing people because you are denying their reality, right? Despite the fact that it's historically unsound as a as an argument. Well, you then apply that abro- across the board. You have to. The goal is to treat people in such a way uh, as to make those who are, par- who are part of the victim categories feel affirmed in every possible way. Uh, and because that's where uh, that's where the inequities have produced the largest effect is in that that sense of of being inferior in this society. So it goes to feeling on the long in, in the end. So if if you, I mean, is there a possibility? I mean, to me there isn't. But is there a possibility to make sure that everyone feels affirmed? I mean. Is, is that even a, a reasonable goal in any shape or form? Well, the, well, that's a complicated question because uh, because it depends upon what we mean by affirmed. Uh, so, if if you want to say that I want to affirm you uh, as a child of God, uh, and that 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 that's a beginning place. There are certain ways in which we affirm people. Uh, in, in that sense, a kind of radical equality. We're equally loved by God. That's one form of affirmation. There's another kind. There are, other, there are many other kinds, including the, the question of, about whether um, uh, I should affirm someone for having not succeeded in the math uh, test. Right? Should, right? Do I, do I, what, what is my responsibility to their, to their emotional well-being? Uh, well, my answer to your responsibility is to help them become better and to teach them better and to give them more help, but not to affirm them for the failure to pass a, a test. Uh, so, you know, the question of affir- – let me give you an example. On my campus, there, uh, there are banners up. Uh, that say, uh, as you drive along, you belong here. Uh, you know, you you are uh, loved here. The, all these sort of abstract claims about, uh, without the reference to who is doing the affirming and who is doing and who is being affirmed. 
But what it doesn't say is, if, 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 if you take the, the one, you belong here, it doesn't say, well, you belong here if, if you graduated from high school and had a, had a good SAT score. It, 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 it is all therapeutic without any reference to the purpose of the university or why it is that you belonging to that university, once you are here, you become a part of the mission and purpose of the university, which is to craft souls, to be, uh, to be, um, uh, to understand who they are, whose they are, who do they belong to in terms of the larger cosmic purpose, and to give them skills that allow them to be good citizens and, and, and uh, to go out in the world and have a successful uh, vocation. Uh, that's how we show belonging, not by simple affirmation. And so it all depends on what you mean by affirmation. But if you mean simply a therapeutic affirmation, I think that is very damaging to people. People need to be affirmed uh, by, uh, by their effort and by their success in terms of the goals of the institution. Yeah, I agree. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Health Main Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Professor Ted McAllister. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with uh, Professor Ted McAllister. So we're, we're talking about that, that kind of a, a emotional affirmation where everyone feels you know, loved and cared for and, and you know, where everyone is supposed to be accepted uh, in every possible way you know, without... I mean, it, that almost seems without a struggle. I mean, you, you, you're not getting... So it's almost like you are going into gym and you are upset because you are not getting to you're not getting to look like the other people that I worked out for years uh, mm-hmm. and you don't want to lift the weight it's exactly that's, that's a very apt uh, image there it uh, and and if you if you are the the instructor at the gym that someone's coming to who doesn't want to work if you care about them and their goals you will put them through their paces. That's what it would mean to care about them. Uh, so if you're a, if you're a professor, uh, as, as in my case, and you care about, about your students, you, you, you first of all find out where they are. What are they capable of understanding? What's their background? How much do they know coming in? And you take them somewhere. And, the, and you put them through their paces so that wherever they started, at the end of it, they are someplace else. They have grown. They've developed. So if they start off with very bad uh, uh, preparation and they don't know the material, and they end up with a C, you have to be proud of them because they've gone from zero to to quite competent. And if they start off at a at the level of of knowing a good bit, and you want to push them to be to to, to get an A because you want them to be better because, uh, to, with, the goal, with the goals of your class in mind. You want them to be better. You don't want to affirm them. You want to make them better. And that's the kind of affirmation that makes sense to me. And so going back here, uh, Pepperdine is a, uh, is a Christian liberal art university. So do you feel that the, uh, the Christian uh, being a, a Christian and believing in the, the critical race theory, are, do they go hand in hand? Uh, no, I, I actually don't think they do. For, first of all, just to clarify, uh, to clarify uh, you know, Pepperdine is, is a university with five schools, including an undergraduate school, Seaver College. Uh, and and Seaver College talks about itself uh, in terms of, of liberal arts, but as do all, so many schools these days. But my essay was was an appeal for a real liberal arts education um, rather than a, simply a vocational education or an ideological education, uh, which is maleducation in this case. Uh, so it is aspirational uh, uh, essay in that sense. Uh, I want the university to be um, a, a liberal arts. But with regard to your question of can you be an advocate for critical race theory and uh, and a Christian, I, I will go so far as to say 
Well, it, it all depends on uh, how serious you are about critical race theory. You'll find people who will use that phrase who, who will, will simply say, well, I, you know, I, I believe that we ought to become, uh, uh, we ought to be engaging with our race problem in America and, and the, the problem of our history and all the rest of that. Well, that presumes that we haven't been, which is, which is not true. But it also, but at that level, if that's all you mean by it, then, then you, you can certainly engage, you should be a part of the university, you should be engaging in those questions. But if you are a, a follower of the advocates of critical race theory or its parent, critical theory, which comes from the 50s and 60s uh, down to our time, it's been developing for some time, uh, if you're an advocate of that school of thought, and there are many faculty here, as there are el uh, elsewhere, who are advocates for that, then you're claiming what I consider to be a heresy. You're claiming Gnosticism. You're claiming to know that you have the lens to see uh, the world as it is, and everyone else around you, uh, including your students, need to be shown how the world really works. You're not engaged in the pursuit of inquiry and asking questions. You don't have humility of, uh, and doubt. You have the answer. You, you, you know that the world is organized around this theory that sees power relations in everything. It sees power relationships in, in every single institution and the way in which we structure our economy, our families, everything. And so you'll hear attacks upon patriarchy. You, you hear all of these code words that are simply suggesting that they understand the power relationships that are, that are privileging some and oppressing the many. And, that, uh, and if you uh, uh, believe that you have this knowledge and, and you're not open for investigation, you're not open for debating it, you're not open for looking at evidence, but in fact you use that theory to impose this vision uh, on, the, on the reality around you and the reality your students are experiencing, then you're an ideologue. And if you're an ideologue, you're, cl you're closed off to uh, the, 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 the first thing that a university is supposed to be about, which is to say inquiry, the pursuit of truth. Right? That, I don't see how you can claim to know how the world works. And not only claim to know how the world works, but have a vision of a just society that you seek to create, you seek to make happen by uh, by empowering your students to go and transform the world. And in that vision, you have the end of all alienation. You have essentially what uh, what is a kind of mar Marxist vision of what the communist utopia will look like, where you have final equity. I don't see how you you can hold those beliefs and be a Christian who understands the fall, who understands the complexity of the tragic and, and the tragic nature of human life, who do, who understands uh, the 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 purposes of an education that are that are designed to help people understand who they are and again whose they are, who they belong to, what what is it that they are, uh, why are they here? on earth? What, what's their purpose in life? If that's not what they're getting them to ask, but instead they're telling them the purpose in life is to transform society, um, then I, I don't see how there's a conversation to be had, and I don't see how they operate with anything close to biblical principles. No, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's from my point of view, and and this, I mean, I I believe that we, you know, we're all, you know, God created us all unique, and with that, we all have different skills, different abilities. Doesn't mean that one is better than the other, but something fits me, like you're saying. Yeah, this this is who I am. This is the impact that I want to have on the world. But here, we're then creating a. A ideology, uh, and then obviously with that ideology, they are then, uh, in order to be able to enforce that ideology, you need then then kind of a governmental acceptance of this, you know, which will then create control, which is then completely against American values and Christian values. That's right. That's right. It, 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 you, there's no there's no getting around that this ideology. Uh, of critical race theory requires 
a control over what people say and what they think, and uh, and ultimately that that goes to a kind of governmental control. Um, that's that's simply the trajectory of it. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Professor Ted McAllister. We're discussing a critical race theory. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Professor Ted McAllister. So, you know, we were looking at, at you know, the I guess the operative word is, is equity. So we're looking at equity within race. But then if we take that another step, let's say equity between profession, you know, like in, in socialism or, you know, you were talking about you know, Karl uh, Marx and, and communism, then you, it, it's pretty much in the government guiding you as to what your role should be. So let's say that you have the intelligence and aptitude you know, to be a researcher or a medical doctor, but you know, the government feels that you need to be a janitor, so now you work as a janitor. I mean, so it, it would follow along with, you know, if this is what we're doing, we are uh, just having an ideology that's just kind of forcing people to become what the ideology tells them to be, uh, rather than who they are, uh, who they want to be, who they're meant to be, and also, obviously, as an individual, we're always driven. We we want to have some kind of a reward system, you know. So if we work hard, we want to see the fruit of our labors. So this then then will take away pretty much the fruit of our labors. Yeah, I don't um, I don't know. Um to what degree critical race theory uh, and the accoutrements of uh, other parts of critical theory are going to, are, have any hope of being successful in a kind of of, um, of communism of the sort you describe? I do believe that's the goal. Um, I I think um, you know first of all I would I would suggest that I have enormous faith in the American people and. Uh, I'm working on a book called Unruly Americans that suggests that Americans are by definition people who don't accept the authority of others except that they consider it legitimate. And so they tend to resist and have a history of resisting uh, those people who challenge their liberties. My bigger concern right now is the attempt to gain control over our thoughts so that we are not able to speak and we're not able to think differently. Um, and you know, I don't know if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with Honor Arendt, the, the great scholar from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but she had a book called Origins of Totalitarianism that was extremely influential in the 50s. And she made a claim that I think is, is very important today, she that totalitarianism does not require – uh, uh, you to be a Nazi or a communist to start with. All it requires is that the, the general population f uh, uh, become incapable of distinguishing between fact or fiction, between what is true and false, where those words no longer mean that. Once, once that happens, once they, people can't distinguish what is real and what, is un what they're told is real and how, and how those are different, what is true, what is fact, and what is fiction, then they can be, then they can be put into a, into a totalitarian system. So the key is to get people to no longer believe their common sense, no longer believe what is right in front of them, to, to get them to believe that, that, that all of the images coming to them from, from media and all the other sources are true, because they, even though they don't appear true in their daily life, they're true because they're told they are. Once that happens, then people are prepared uh, for tyranny. And um, that's my biggest fear, um, that they, they, will, they will never get to making us into a, to, into a communist system where everyone has to be is told where to go and what to do. They will, they will, it'll destroy itself before then. But, but before we get there, we're at threat of, of, of losing our entire tradition of liberty and, uh, uh, and of 
our ability to govern ourselves, to be self-regulating as communities, as individuals, and as a nation by, by being deceived to such a point where we can no longer distinguish between right and wrong, between fact and fiction, and we no longer trust our own judgment and our own experience. For me, that is, that is the grave threat that is much larger than critical race theory, but which, of which it's a part. And, and you, uh, yeah, that, that's actually going to be one of my <laughs> next questions. I mean, one, one of your book that you wrote, you talk about you know, exactly what you're saying, that Americans, you know, we, we are a conservative people. You know, we have a certain way of life, you know, certain beliefs. Uh, we, we have certain structure, family structure, uh, and we get, you know, we do all these voluntary associations, you know, where we connect you know, with each other and, and we have a common purpose, common goal. And you feel that this is something that has been under assault, you know, assault by, you, know, you mentioned, progressive elite for, for many generations. So this is something that's been going on for quite some time. That's right. That's right. It's been going on for several decades. Yeah, but I, but I, uh, I don't think it. You know, I gave a uh, of a, a lecture uh, recently to uh, the Pasadena Republican Club, uh, of, and I was surprised by their reception because I thought they would sort of be old guard Republicans. But my argument was that that um, we now know. Uh, that the last 20 or 30 years of Republican and Democratic rule has been in favor of, uh, of, a, of a global elite and against the common sense and everyday experience of Americans, and that, um, that we can no longer be fooled, that it, it's, that it, it has been revealed. And so the only thing that's left to those who have power, and I, I wrote an essay on, um, on the nature of our elites today, and I said the only thing they have left is the naked exercise of power, the, the, the naked violation of the Constitution that the, the, the current administration is engaging in. They're not even attempting to hide it. Um, that is, is, is a sign of, of failure on their part. And even on critical race theory, if you just hone in on that, and particularly in the K through 12 schools, you can go on YouTube and you can find hundreds of videos of of parents uh, going to uh, to school board meetings, and 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 not scholars, not activists, just parents who are who who now see what they're doing to their children and and are saying, no, we're not going to accept this. What what you're going to find happening, and already starting, is that as this grassroots movement of resistance against everything from critical race theory in public schools to the, to the larger uh, transgender agenda being imposed upon us from a variety of sources, the resistance to that is going to be seen as what they, they like to call it astroturf, as though as though Fox and, uh, and you know, various kinds of powerful institutions are directing it, but it's not real. But I'm telling you that my experience of this and my own, as an historian, study of the American character suggests that the resistance is, is real and it is deep and it's not going away. And uh, so I'm very hopeful, actually, um, I'm, uh, I, and I'm excited about what's coming because once people are aware that their liberties are being taken and that, their child, and, and, that, and that people are after their children, they're trying to, they don't believe parents should, should uh, teach their children the values, they believe the state should, and the state should be governed by global uh, interests um, that do not have our values. Uh, once they realize that's happening, then um, there's not much that the elite can do. Um, the, the, the resistance uh, will become far too widespread. And it will become widespread not just in red states. It's becoming widespread in, in blue states as well. So I, that's where I think this is going in the next uh, four to six years. Yeah, which, which, and, and I, I agree with you, and I, I see that a lot you know, with our, within our own state, you know, seeing the changes that are the, the political environment, the changes in political environment, and seeing how 
people are now stepping in, being engaged, and recognizing that they, you know, they can't just idly sit there and thinking that everything is going to take place according to their desire, everything's going to go well, but they're realizing if they don't step in, you know, like our forefathers, you know, we don't step in and don't do anything, uh, then all of a sudden everything's going to be lost, and, and they can't agree to, with that. And aren't you also finding that people are stepping in now? Absolutely. It's, it's not, it, there are all those people who are telling me in my world, even those who are on my side of the equation, the conservative side, are saying, well, I don't think we can trust the people. To, to, they're, they're too passive. They're just not they're going to accept this. I find evidence every day of the opposite, that, they, that, that conservatives are much more polite about it than the left, about their resistance. But they're much more resolved in their resistance. They're not going to give up uh, a, a thousand years of development from England through America of, of our peculiar uh, uh, style of, of self-rule and liberty and protections. Um, and I think, a re- I think a reclaiming of the Constitution and its principles is already happening. I think, and I think you'll see much more of it in the next election, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Well... Professor McAllister, it's been such a pleasure to, to chat with you today, and, and, and I'm so grateful for you know, trying to bring sense into such a complex issue, And because uh, there's a lot of people that don't have the ability to see beyond just different you know, slogans that are thrown at them, to really analyze and look behind and what the, the forces that are re- really driving this and also what the ultimate outcome will look like uh, if we go down that road. So thank you so much, Professor McAllister. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is it for today. You're listening to Health Made Radio. Remember, check us out at healthmade.co. Health is what you make it. 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 Is what